So let me summarize uh, where we are right now with Romans 3. And uh, I'll get over to the board here. And uh, let's do a bit of a timeline here. So let's, got a line. And we have past. And let's make this present. And future. All right. So that's, that's the basic timeline. I guess I didn't do a very good job of that. Uh, let me balance it out at least so for the record. All right, so past, present, and future. And Paul says the problem of sin is that all have sinned. And that's that point in the past, that kind of a blob, you know, that, that mess, that pile over there all have sinned and fall short. And the fall short uh, is ongoing, so it refers to both the present and the future. So as we move forward with our lives, uh, the have sinned is in the past, the fall short is the present reality that extends on into the future. And the beauty of the present participle which is what being justified is, the beauty of that is that it covers completely, continuously both main verbs. So in the present, let's say, you are justified, all right? It covers the have sinned of the past, but it also covers the falling short of the present and the future, if you wish to put it that way. You, you see what, uh, what this is? To me, this is really significant. For me, it was life-changing. I'm, I'm honest, I'm, I'm telling you, this was the most important thing maybe I ever learned out of the Bible. Because for much of my life, I had believed in forgiveness of the have sinned. And, and we could call this forgiveness, all right? So I believed in forgiveness. I believed that the stuff that happened in the past could be forgiven. But what about the present and the future? And to the degree that I uh, felt that justification was simply forgiveness, then my task from that time on is to live without sinning, if you wish, to live without messing up. And it was discouraging, in one sense, to hear everyone continually fall short. But it's then encouraging to discover that even in the falling short, we are filled up full. So you could say, these are the bad deeds, and these are the good deeds. Even the good deeds need justification because they're not good enough. They fall short of the glory of God. So in Jesus Christ, two things happen. First of all, you have the death of Christ, and this lies in the background of Romans 3. Paul discusses it in Corinthians and other places very clearly. Uh, but in this particular spot, uh, it, it, he doesn't describe the cross and so on, but the blood of Christ, the death of Christ, focuses on the sins, but the life of Christ, his perfect obedience, focuses on the good deeds. In other words, the good things that I do that fall short of the glory of God no longer fall short when they're covered with the righteousness of Christ. Because his perfect, complete, falling long deeds are sufficient for all of that. So, you have the two sides here, to sin and the two sides to justification. If you have a limited justification, if it's only forgiveness, then there's a sense which after that it's up to you to kind of fill up the full. And that is discouraging. In fact, that drives us into kind of a secondary legalism. You know, primary legalism is where you say, well, 
I have to atone for that too by just working real hard, being really, really good. And maybe if I'm really, 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 really good, uh, maybe if I have more good deeds than all of this, I can tip the scale. You know, both Muslims and Jews, uh, there are sayings uh, in those religions that suggest that in the judgment, our good deeds and our bad deeds are weighed on a scale. And if the good deeds outweigh the bad, then you're in. And if it's 50-50, God kind of lays his thumb on the good deeds side and tips you over into the good side. So if you make 50-50, God will kind of tip you in uh, to make up the difference. But that is not Paul. That's not the gospel. The gospel is that the provision that was made in Christ covers both the bad deeds and the good deeds. You see, a Muslim would not, would not get this. Because to a Muslim, there is no such thing really as sin. There's just forgetfulness, you know, stumbling, mistakes, and stuff like that. And it, it's, it's not as serious. Paul has a very serious view of sin. Even your best efforts are messed up. Bad, you see. And the gospel is coming to two convictions. Number one, I am so messed up that there's nothing I can do to get out of here. That's part of the gospel. To come to that recognition, the authenticity, to be able to be real about it, like Luther, to say, yeah, that's a pretty complete list. But now i got something to tell you. The blood of Jesus covers all sin. So until the list is complete, it wasn't even worth talking about. But now that it's complete, it's worthless, you see. So the gospel is on the one hand recognizing the depths of your sin and, and how far you are from the glory of God. But on the positive side, it's realizing that in Jesus Christ, it works for all of that. Not only the mistakes of the past, but even the good things you plan to do today aren't good enough. And therefore, it's such an assurance to know that even when my best efforts fail, it's okay. Because if I'm walking in Jesus Christ, I'm seen in relation to Him. If I'm in relation to Him, uh, then I don't need to bow my head. I can hold my head high and say, I'm a child of the King. I'm cleansed by the blood, and I'm also justified by the righteousness. You know, see, my miserable good deeds are now shining like gold, because they're covered with His righteousness. And that frees us to actually do good works without a selfish motive. We're not doing it for ourselves anymore. We're doing it out of rejoicing, uh, out of gratitude, and so on. Verse 24, Romans 3, verse 24. Because we now have to come to the issue of if God is somehow taking somebody who broke the law and treating them as if they hadn't broken the law. How do you get away with that legally? So that's, that's sort of the logic Paul is wrestling with. How do you get away with that legally? And so Paul expands in verse 24, uh, expands the thing beyond the simple statement that you are justified. So we are justified freely. How? By His grace. So it's free, and it's by grace. So let's write that down. Ground number one for justification is by grace. And you see, as far as possible, when you're doing exegesis, you want to use the biblical language. We are being justified by grace. Freely, you could say. And here's the interesting thing. The freely and the grace are really two ways of saying the same thing. They're kind of related to the idea of a gift. Some forms of these words can, can mean gift. Uh, the freely can be translated in John 15 without a cause. Jesus says, they hated me without a cause. There was no reason, no cause for them to hate Jesus. They hated him freely. 
without a reason. That's the meaning here. We are justified for no reason, without a cause, freely. How? By His grace. So it's kind of like freely, freely, you know, by His grace. Grace is unmerited favor. Grace is a quality in God's heart, not in mine. This is not something about me. Grace is something that happens in God. No amount of believing can win you justification. No amount of obeying, no amount of repenting, no amount of praying causes God to reckon us as just. His grace is sufficient to accept the unacceptable. And uh, remember, how does the justification happen? It is continuous. So if the justification is continuous, so is the grace. The grace is continuous. In fact, uh, I think of uh, the book Great Controversy. It's page 641, where the people of God see Jesus coming in the clouds. And what do you think they're thinking when God's people see Jesus coming? Are they going to be hooping and hollering and saying, yep, you know, this is the time. We're ready for this, boy. We we're, deserve this. And we're going to go up and we're going to be in glory land. It's going to be great. We, we might say they're freaking out. And what are they freaking out? What are they saying? They are saying, she quotes the words of Revelation 6, who shall be able to stand? Who shall be able to stand? When they see him coming, they're overwhelmed. You know what his answer is? He says, my grace is sufficient for you. It's a grace that is free. It's a grace that we haven't earned. It's a quality in God's heart. And it's continuous. Even at the second coming, we're still saved by grace. You see? And if that were not true, we would be of all people most miserable. So, Paul here brings clarity, brings certainty into where we stand with God. But he doesn't end with grace. Because if he did, then God would be kind of like an indulgent parent. You know what an indulgent parent is? You're in the grocery store, and you see a little kid there by himself, trashing the place, you know, pulling stuff off the shelves, making a mess, squeezing the Charmin, you know, all those things you're not supposed to do. And you're just horrified at this, you know, where's your mother? And about at this time, the mother comes around the corner, takes one look at this mess, and this kid in this, this pile of stuff smiles and says, isn't he cute? <laughs> and at that moment you're saying, I'll show you cute. <laughs> Do something about this or else. You know. well, that's the indulgent parent. If it's simply grace, then it doesn't really matter what we do. So that's a piece, but there's more. Reading on. Verse 24, searching for his language here. We are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus or in Christ Jesus. There's a, the translation here is interesting, but I think in the Greek it's in, uh, the word in. So we would use in Christ Jesus. It's by grace and it's in Christ Jesus. So the second ground for justification here is that it's not only by grace, but it's in Christ. And what does that mean? Through the redemption which is in Christ. That term redemption is always associated with the cross. 
uh, in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, it's actually associated with the Exodus. God redeemed his people. He, he did something costly. He did something uh, heavy, major act. It was a mighty act to deliver Israel out of Egypt, and it's a mighty act to provide grace. Grace costs us nothing, but it cost him everything. In John 1, it says, grace came by Christ Jesus. So the grace of God is free, but it's not cheap. It cost the infinite life of the Son of God. Here's, here's where the legal thing comes in very, very strongly, because you see you have a law, and the law says the wages of sin is death. That's Paul. That's Romans. So he can say that right in here. Whatever he's saying about the gospel, it's not contradicting when he says the wages of sin is death. So if you sin and you don't reap the wage, something's happened. Something has changed the calculus of the law, and here's what it is. The law is there. The wages of sin are death. So every sin that has ever been sinned cries out for some kind of compensation, some kind of atonement. Could an angel step in and say, I'm going to die for the human race? No. Because an angel is a creature. An angel has the value of one. If that angel, perhaps, I, I don't know how this would work, but perhaps God would permit that that angel might die for one person. Maybe that could happen. Okay, I'm not even sure how that would work. But still, it's not really the solution. So who is it that dies on the cross? It's the creator of the universe. That's why the creation passages in John 1 are so important. All things were made by him. And apart from him, not one single thing was made that was made. So he's the creator of the entire universe. That means that anything in creation, any sin that was ever sinned or ever could be sinned by that creation was atoned for at the cross. The cross is equal in value to every sin that was ever sinned or ever could be sinned. That means it need never be repeated. The value of the cross is not in the action. The action was horrific. The value of the cross is in the one who acted. If Jesus is only human, then if he was perfect, like an angel, he could die for one of us. But if he's more than human, if he's truly God himself, if he's the creator of the universe, then his death could atone for all. Yes? I don't understand how one angel could die for one person because we didn't sin against the angel. Did we not sin against God? I mean, I don't understand how. Well, it's just the idea of a sub, as a substitutionary value, at most one, could, one for one. Uh, and I, as I said, I'm not sure how that would work. So it, the Bible doesn't say that. I'm just saying, could an angel? No. And the reason is the angel doesn't have the kind of value that's needed. Uh, don't want to take the analogy too far, thanks. Uh, but uh, perhaps, you know, there could be a one-for-one -one correspondence. But the whole human race, the whole universe, no. Not, the value's not there. So, but Jesus, as the one who made everything, there's a death that's equal in value with all of that. Now, keep in mind, if he would have died just for you, what kind of value does that imply? You have been valued with the whole universe. You know, some, some people value someone more if they drive a BMW, you know, or if they have a $20 million house or something like that. Well, the creator of the universe, how much is he worth in relation to that? No comparison. You see, that's the kind of value 
that you have uh, in Jesus Christ. So he, hanging on the cross, took all the consequences of our sin. He acted with perfect obedience before God. And the infinite value of his person is infused into both of those. So you have infinite righteousness, infinite forgiveness, infinite justice and justification. So in Christ, God has more than a legal right to justify every one of us. More than enough to do that. Uh, he has, the, the, the cost has been paid to the infinite level. But doesn't it, it just seems crazy. I mean, obviously, like we have these conversations all the time, mm -hmm. but it's like Jesus had to die because, well, they made the rule, like God made the rule that sin and death, like that sin causes death. And so it's like, well, you essentially killed yourself because you made up the rule. And I know the whole, well, to show the whole universe, but still, like, obviously, if there could have been another way, I'm sure they would have done that. But yeah. it still sounds crazy. Mm -hmm. And certainly logic breaks down at this point. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because there are probably dynamics that can't even be expressed in human language. Remember the two-year-old uh, concept. I think it's very important to keep in mind. Because God is attempting to explain these things to two-year-olds. You know, imagine how far you'd get theologically with a two-year-old from our knowledge and then take what God knows and has to deal with and compare. Um, I know, because it sounds crazy, there are some people who want to reject this very concept even though it's clearly in Paul and, and clearly uh, biblical. There is a sense that there is a necessity in the cross that maybe cannot be fully expressed uh, in language that we can understand. But the one thing I think is reasonably clear, the value of Jesus Christ is equal to the entire universe. And uh, evidently, there is, yeah, I guess you could say, is the law arbitrary? Or is it in some sense inherent in the very nature of God and the universe. In other words, that God didn't set out and say, this is the way I'm going to make it, but this is the way it is. Um, it's interesting that in Deuteronomy, when he gives the law to Israel, he then uh, says that he himself will keep it. So whether this law is a natural extension of some universal principle, or something that he asks us to do, he himself is willing to observe it. Notice he is willing to subject himself to his own law. And uh, that's an amazing thing. Law of substitution, that can be a hard one for people to grasp. There's one illustration that helps me a little bit. Uh, during the Civil War, there was a young Adventist fellow who uh, didn't feel like killing other Christians was a good thing. And he did not want to go to the war, but he got a letter from the draft that he needed to go to the war. But there was a provision in the draft law that if someone could not or would not go, uh, they could find a substitute. They could find someone who could go in their place. And he had a friend who was actually eager to go and disappointed that he wasn't called. And the friend volunteered to go in his place. And so he went and he joined the Union Army and they marched down to a place called Shiloh in Mississippi. And there was a very, very major battle that took place there. And he was killed. About a year later, another letter comes to the young Adventist fellow. Says, you're drafted again. And he wrote a letter back. He said, you cannot draft me. I'm dead. 
and they had never received a letter from the dead before, so they decided to investigate and bring it into court, and he won the case. It was determined that when his substitute died, he had died to the draft. He could not be drafted again. And that, that helps me just a little bit uh, with this concept. And not everybody relates to all of this the same way. Um, for me, this is a very important concept because growing up German uh, in a home where everything was to be thus and so, and uh, Kimberly remembers what my mother was like, <laughs> and uh, yeah, everything supposed to be in place, and uh, and the soldiers march together, and so on, and uh, so there was a strong sense of obligation a strong sense that you had to do the right thing or else. And that usually comes with a strong sense that you aren't making it. <laughs> You're not good enough, you know, see. And for a long time I resisted, you know, God loves you so much that he would save you. I wasn't going to buy that. Love is not a reason to undo the law. It's not a reason to, uh, you know, bury the past. And this helped me because it helped me to see that however we understand it, God had a way of, of legalizing the action. It was not unjust. It wasn't illegal for God to save us. Now, it brings me to something that I was going to do later, but let me do it now. And I see just enough space over here on the, this spot because in the New Testament, the concept of salvation is found in biblical language. And uh, usually it goes something like this. You have a problem and a solution. A problem and a solution. All right. In Romans 3, the problem could be described as guilt. Everyone is guilty before the law. Guilty before God. If guilt is your problem, what's the, what's the domain for guilt? I mean, what, what, what living concept is involved there? Well, let's not think religiously now. Let's just think in, in regular terms. If somebody's guilty, that's usually in what context do we use that language? Guilty is charged, okay? Legal, so it's law court mm -hmm. language. And if you don't mind uh, erasing just a little bit of it, why don't I put that on the side here? You have uh, the law court, all right? So that's the domain. So if you are guilty, what do you need? You need acquittal or justification, it's the same thing. To be justified means to be treated as right before the law. It is just, it is fair, it's appropriate. So that's law court language, it's a metaphor. All right, let's try this one. The, you see the problem as debt. It's a debt that you owe. What's the domain now? All right, accounting, all right, or banking, financial. So you have a banking, accounting metaphor. All right, you owe a debt. What is the solution? Uh-huh. Forgiveness. See, we, these are now spiritual terms, and we think of them in that way. But they were metaphors for the writers of the Bible. The writers of the Bible were, were using everyday language to describe things that could not be described in another way. Let's, uh, let's see. Uh, let's say the problem is to be dirty. What's the solution? All right, cleansing. And you could call that a household metaphor or a temple metaphor. Because sanctuaries have clean and dirty, clean and unclean. So uh, you have uh, a couple possibilities of metaphor there. Uh, the problem is you are a captive. What's the solution? Redemption. 
redeem the captives. And that's perhaps, you know, military or political domain. Um, let's try another one. Enmity. Estrangement. What kind of domain is that? Social, okay. Social, relational, okay. What's the solution if enmity is the problem? Reconciliation. And so it goes. There's probably 20 of these in the New Testament. Uh, and there may even be more than that. So you have all these domains. So what is happening is the writers of the Bible are searching for metaphors, for language with which they can describe that which is infinite in its scope. So coming back to your original question, um, it sounds crazy. Okay? And the beauty of all this is that one person's crazy is another person's miracle, sometimes. A metaphor that doesn't work for you may work for somebody else. And there are people for whom, without the legal metaphor, they would never have peace. I needed to know that it was legal for God to save me. That he wasn't doing some kind of heavenly hanky-panky here. That just wasn't right. And we'll talk a lot more about these legal terms uh, later on in the class. But uh, for people, there are many people that look at the law court metaphors and say, I don't relate to that at all. Especially people who love the re relational domain, perhaps. Uh, other people who like the, you know, the, the household type of metaphors. Uh, the, they often ha may struggle more uh, with the legal metaphors. So, Paul here is speaking in the legal realm. And uh, we will draw out what he says, because uh, that's the, uh, the text that we're looking at. You try, you try not to define Paul in terms of some systematic concept that you have in mind. Uh, and by the way, salvation is even a metaphor, really, although it's come to mean everything. Because what's the problem for salvation? You're lost, okay? You are, uh, you need rescue. So if you are lost or if, uh, if you're captive or something, you need to be saved. By the way, the word for salvation also means healing. Your faith has saved you. It's often translated, your faith has healed you. So uh, the, the, the word for salvation it implies physical healing as well as uh, spiritual healing. All right, so we have two grounds here. One is by grace. The second is in Jesus Christ, in Christ Jesus. And then verse 28. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith or through faith apart from observing the law. So in the, in the Greek, he uses different uh, prepositions here. It is through faith, by grace, in Christ, through faith. You see, if you stopped with number two, by grace and in Christ covers how many? They cover everybody. Everybody who could possibly need what Christ has done is covered by grace and by the cross, by Christ, by the blood. So if you stopped with number two, then everybody would be saved. Satan too, no exceptions. So would that be a good idea? So there's the catch. That's the catch. Like, 
Nothing's free. Here's okay. A, that's what it sounds like. All right. I'm hoping would, you'll make it sound Would better. that be good? If everybody was saved. No. What's wrong with it? It won't be bad. Some people don't want to be saved. Okay, so saving everyone would be trampling on freedom? Yes. Mm -hmm. And God doesn't do that. that. That's one of the keys to the whole great controversy idea, is that God made us free because freedom is the only way to have love. And if love is the core of God's essence and nature, then when God creates creatures, they must be free. Because if you're not free, you cannot love. You can only be compelled. And so God wants us to love freely and to have the joy of that and to receive the joy of that. And so he's made us free. So God can't save everyone because he respects our freedom. We must choose. Uh, faith is not, however, a work. That's, that's the challenge. What do we mean by faith? And we'll, we'll go deeper into this in the book of James. We'll come to that a little bit later. But, uh, and, and, and unpack that a little bit more. But faith is not a work. Uh, if I can use an analogy, it's more like an empty hand that reaches out for the gift. God has a gift. It's called salvation. It's given by grace. It's paid for in Christ, whatever that paid for means. All right? But he isn't going to force it on us. He isn't going to mash it into our face. He says, here it is. I, I want you to take it. But you have to choose. I'm not going to make you receive it. He says in verse 28, and Kimberly, you said the catch, you know. He says in verse 28, we maintain a man is justified by faith apart from observing the law or apart from works. So faith is not a work. And yet it's essential to the gospel being taken hold of by ourselves. What did it mean, faith? Uh, the, the essence of faith could be summarized in the word trust, I think. Faith is maybe not the best translation for the Greek word, but it's rather trust. Trust is something you aim toward God. Say, I trust that God can save me. I trust in what Christ has done. And uh, trust means willing to stake your life on that, on what God has done. The example that, that works best for me is a story you may have heard, but it's about a famous tightrope walker who uh, strung a cable over Niagara Falls. And you're probably aware that every year there are people who try to go over Niagara Falls in a barrel and 95% of them don't survive. So you string a cable over Niagara Falls and you fall off the cable and it's over. So uh, built a crowd, this was 100 years ago or so, but he was sort of an early evil Knievel. And he walked across the falls and back on the cable. Everybody cheered. And he says, uh, how many of you think I could cross with a wheelbarrow? <laughs> sure. Well, we believe you can do that. So he took the wheelbarrow and he walked the wheelbarrow across and came back. And everybody cheered. And he says, all right. He says, how many of you think I could carry a person across in that wheelbarrow? Everybody raised their hand. And then he said, who will be first? <laughs> For me, 
That's the difference between faith and simply belief. You know, I believe you can carry somebody across in there, but I'm not going to stake my life on it. I'm not going to trust to the extent that I'll put myself in there, put myself in jeopardy. Faith is not a work, but it's relying so steeply on God that you're willing to risk your entire life, everything you have, all of your ambitions, all of your future, everything you hope and dream for, you give to Him without reservation. That's faith. And for those who do that, they are freely justified in everything that they have done, both evil and good. Any questions on this? What I think Paul does here is walk the fine line. On the one hand, he wants it to be clear. It is absolutely free. There is nothing you can do to earn it. There is no work that will buy it. But it does require, in another sense, everything you have. He who wishes to save his life must, what, lose it. One of the problems we have, I think, with Scripture is we tend to approach everything with logic. And logic, as we understand it, is grounded in Greek philosophical thinking, which is not the only possible way of thinking. In fact, it's rather a minority in the world, I think, that uh, truly buys that 100%. Logic is not capable of grasping the things of God. Remember what we read the text yesterday, you know, you're not able without the Spirit to grasp the things of God. They, they're crazy to you. There's that word, Kimberly, you, you help us there. That's kind of what Paul is saying. They are foolishness. It's nuts to think that something that happened in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago has anything to do with me today. That's nuts. And in Corinthians, he says that the preaching of the cross is a stumbling block to the Jews and idiocy to the, to the Gentiles. Crazy. Foolish. So it is, in a sense, a foolish message. Paul talks about the foolishness of preaching. But he didn't mean that preaching is foolish. He meant the foolishness of what is preached, the foolishness of the gospel. And yet to those who grasp it, it's the most life-changing thing possible. So then, I have a friend who we've talked about, who grew up in Adventist, grew up in the church, was one of the spiritual ones in high school, was involved in all the things and preached and taught and did Pathfinders and all this stuff but never believed. Like, he believed, maybe, but he didn't have faith, or he tried to, and finally one day was just like, I don't have to believe. And in that moment, had more peace than he'd ever experienced in his life. And he asked me recently, how do I, how do I become an Adventist again? How do I believe in God? I'd like to believe, but I don't. So he's approaching it trying to find logic in it, and he doesn't see the logic. Maybe he's right. <laughs> Paul, at least in Corinthians, now Corinth was one of those really secular, materialistic places. You know, it was a New York City of the ancient world. It uh, was in this little isthmus uh, between Italy and, uh, the, and the Near East, and every, everything came through there. All the trade came through there, all the prostitution and all the uh, the, the, the wealth and the dissipation and the parties and everything is going on in Corinth. And I don't doubt that the majority of the people who heard Christian preaching just laughed in Corinth. And yet uh, those who received it found in it life. Um, do you think it's helpful maybe to think of these metaphors? 
When he says, I'd like to believe, but I can't, what does he mean by believe? Is he meaning what Paul is saying by faith or by belief? Or is it not some other sense maybe in which he is grasping onto God? I mean, if he, if, he's, if he wants to be part of the church, if he wants to know what he's supposed to do and so on, does God maybe read something in his heart? I mean, I mean just, just, just using as an example, do you, do you feel that in some ways he's closer to God than, than your friends who have never doubted? Definitely. Well, then, doesn't God read that? Maybe the whole thing is he's trying to have faith. And, and God is not asking you for a work. If you're turning faith into a work, then it can be hard. But faith at some point is just saying, I need this so bad, I'm willing to give up everything to have it. And if he said that, it kind of sounds the way I'm hearing it, it sounds like maybe he has. If he's saying that, I want it so bad, I'm willing to give up anything, then maybe he has more of it than we think, or he thinks. I guess I'd want to know, what did he believe? Really, what did he believe? He didn't actually leave. He's still there. Like, he still goes to church. No, but something he left, and he felt peace. Mm. So what did he leave? Mm. Good. Mm. I think it was more like legalistic works. Well, there you are. So he left what Paul would call a counterfeit of the gospel. <laughs> and he feels bad about it because somehow he was trained that that was the only way to live. And if he hadn't, he would be one of these guys that Gus visits on their deathbed saying, I haven't done enough. Mm -hmm. Right? And there's so many of those. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know what, when you're, when you're visiting the bedside, does it matter whether you have peace or not? Yes, it does. You can't fix someone where you can. No. Hmm. So maybe that's why the class is the way it is. Yeah. We've got to talk about these things. We've, we've got to wrestle with the root of it. And, 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 and maybe sometimes we have concepts of salvation that may be helpful to us but destructive to others if we insist on them. And, uh, you know, uh, Kimberly reacted the way many react. Uh, when you hear the legal gospel, not everybody responds and says, well, that explains everything. Now I'm so happy. You know, some people kind of say, if that's the way it is, I don't want to have any part of it. But they may respond to one of these other metaphors with joy. So as you go through the Bible, be looking for metaphors of salvation. You know, keep in mind that dynamic, problem-solution. And when you see the problem being expressed, you say, okay, what domain are we in here? This is not an absolute. This is a metaphor because the things of God are bigger than we can understand. No one's ever seen, heard, or touched God in, in, in the full physical sense. We can only speak about Him in analogies. So as you go through Bible, look for the analogies. And some writers love one analogy and other writers love another. And the more of these analogies you can pick up, the, the bigger your grasp of God will be and the more people you can help. So uh, that would be, uh, I think, a point of, of practicality. Now, it's interesting, verse 25 and 26. What is the purpose of of God's action. And this comes back maybe to the crazy comment. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. By the way, there's a, there's a book coming out on salvation uh, that uh, is by the seminary, and I'll highly recommend it when it comes. Uh, I wrote a chapter in there on the atonement at the cross. And, uh, you know, coming back to Kimberly's crazy challenge, um, when you say, why the atonement? Why the cross? Why the blood? Why this nasty, messy thing? I think I offer at least ten 
biblically grounded explanations. And every one of them is offensive to somebody. <laughs> so if you come to the bedside with one explanation, you may end up in a great conflict. You know, somebody may say, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. And then what are you going to say? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it hasn't been finished yet. I, I wrote my chapter. I don't know about anybody else. But as I, as I looked through it, I said, this is going to be good. This is going to be helpful. And Atonement at the Cross was a fantastic experience for me to study that and read all the scholarship and the different viewpoints back and forth and, and then read the Bible texts. And, uh, so it was kind of neat. And uh, maybe I should attach it to you guys on the, on the, on the website and uh, toss that in there. Uh, use it judiciously since it isn't published yet, but you can just use it for yourself and as long as you don't tell anyone where you got it, it's okay. You can act like you thought of it yourself. I don't mind. I'm not, I'm not worried too much about people plagiarizing my stuff. It's not plagiarism until it's published. Well, but even then, I figure, you know, whatever. Yeah, I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> Point is, I don't mind sharing it with you. Uh, don't hesitate to send, a, send an email reminding me. Um, so God says at verse 25 he presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood that's another one the faith of his blood in the Greek so it's not clear if it's the way the NIV translates or it's the other way is, is it a sacrifice of atonement through, through faith in his blood meaning our faith in his blood or is it sacrifice atonement through the faithfulness of Christ's blood. That his blood represents his faithfulness. He observed the law. He kept it perfectly to the end. And therefore, his sacrifice is an innocent sacrifice. He did not deserve it whatsoever. And therefore, he could give it as a gift to those who don't deserve a similar gift. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus Christ. What this says is that the cross was necessary not only to save us but it was a necessity somehow in God's heart. It had to happen in order for things to end up where they're supposed to be. Do we understand this? Definitely not. But he was demonstrating that when he forgives sins, he's not doing it illegally. This, this verse was just so important for me. Maybe not for any of you. But for me it was so important to recognize that when God said, I can treat you as if you'd never sinned. It wasn't illegal. See, I still don't get that part. How, how, is, it not how is it not illegal? Mm -hmm. Well, he's saying that it is the actions of Christ that demonstrate that it is just, that it is righteous. Yeah. Does that explain it? Well, he's creator. So anything that affects the creation is within his realm to do. Yeah. If he were not the creator, you know, like you were saying, maybe the angel for somebody else, uh, that, uh, that would definitely be challenging. But yeah. if, he, if he can do anything because he's the creator, then why did he have to, to die? Why does Quit using logic. Why does everybody have, <laughs> have to have faith? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Those are tough questions. You know, when, when what uh, makes sense to one doesn't make sense to another, that's when it becomes a challenge, yeah. But, uh, it's, you know, as I read the text, the rightness of this is grounded in who he is. And he's taking responsibility for his creation. 
He made us free. So in the end, you, could, you can almost, in a sense, blame him. He made us free. He didn't have to. could have made us robots. And then this would never have happened. So he takes responsibility for choices we made. And in so doing, pays the price for our freedom. Maybe an analogy that would make sense in a chaplaincy context is forgiveness. Somebody does something very hurtful to you. Your heart cries out for justice. That person ought to be pummeled, ought to be pounded, you know, ought to be flattened for what they did to me. It would only be fair and equal for the terrible pain that I'm living with. And so you go through life punishing that person for what they did to you inside of yourself. But you eventually draw the conclusion that person doesn't even know. <laughs> they don't even care, maybe. Not even aware of what's going on inside of you. And you begin to realize, I'm punishing myself. And so then you come to the idea of forgiveness, and forgiveness ultimately is saying, okay, I'm going to take this pain. I'm going to take the cost of what this person did. I'm going to take it on myself. I'm going to forgive. I'm going to say, you're no longer responsible. I release you. And in releasing that person from the consequences of what they did to you, you're taking it upon yourself. And of course, the beauty of that psychologically is when you take it upon yourself, it frees you. It breaks the chains to that person and breaks the chains to that action. So in a very human sense, there's a, there's a payoff, you could say, as well as that. But it is, it is truly saying, I'm no longer going to punish that person for what they did. I'm going to take it on myself. I'm going to absorb it myself so that we can both move on. And uh, so when Christ died on the cross, there's something of that taking the consequence of what others have done upon oneself so that they can be free. It's, it's a, the ultimate sacrifice of love. Not making any sense? Let me think about it too. And there's more of this class to go. There's, there's a whole biblical world, this biblical theological world we haven't explored yet that may be helpful but, uh, as we go on. And this is such an interesting analogy because it's like we, we sin and we hurt Jesus' feelings. And so he could just walk around heaven stomping around mm -hmm. being like, oh, that person deserves to die, blah, 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 blah. But, and then, then, and then maybe Jesus stops and realizes, like, they don't even know. Like, they don't even know that they're hurting my feelings. Mm -hmm. So then I'm just hurting myself. So I can be angry for eternity and squash them like ants. Mm -hmm. Um... <laughs> Or I can, in a way, justify or prove to the universe that, like, I'm a bigger person. I'm a more mature adult in this situation, so I will forgive them. And, you know, what is the cost of letting go and forgiving? And some people live their whole life never even knowing the story of Jesus, which is kind of like how when we're upset about something and we forgive them, they don't even know what happened. And it could be days, months, years later, and it's like, you don't even know, but I've forgiven you. And like, they don't need to know. But it, it's, so in a way, it's like, so Jesus is justifying to the universe that he's the bigger adult, that he's the one who traded his diaper for adult pants so that he forgave. And I think there's an element of truth in the way that you're saying it, although the way we say it can also be you know, distorted and misunderstood as well. But uh, there's a sense in which uh, God is demonstrating his character. That it's, it's not, you know, it's easy to not see the whole thing. That's why I'm struggling here because all these questions are so large, you know. And 
if it was simply a case, if everything was equal, and you just say, well, God is just justifying himself. You know? But it's not just that, because you have a context in which there is a deliberate deceiver, a liar out there. And he is planting all kinds of things about God that are completely destroying people and destroying the universe. And God has two choices. Like you said, he can squash the bug, start over, but then for anyone who wasn't squashed, that would be a very sobering experience. Hey, maybe if I get out of line, I'll be the next one to be squashed, you see? And that's not going to work for God. So he chooses the slow and painful path of demonstrating that he is the more mature adult, demonstrating that he's not arbitrary and vengeful, but that he will be forgiving to the point of his own destruction that his love goes so deep he would do anything to save us, including destroying himself. And that type of convincing people is not nearly as efficient as grabbing them by the throat. You know, but efficiency is not what God is after. He's after a universe that chooses and loves and, and, and delights in who he is. And if faith is trust, Trust isn't going to happen when you force your way. Trust is only going to happen when somebody says, wow, God is the most admirable being in the universe. And if I put my life in his hands, I'm in the best possible place. And that's trust. That's faith. And then it all comes free at that point. The price, and there is a price, is giving up ourselves, giving up self giving up our ambitions, giving up uh, our ways of saving ourselves. Oh, just one more. Yeah, oh, this is good. Which just helped me, it makes sense, was thinking about David and Absalom and how crazy David seems. Mm. He seems like a crazy person because he's upset when Absalom is murdered, when Absalom did all those awful things to him. And I think if given the choice, David would have would have traded his life for Absalom's. Mm. And it doesn't make any sense at all. But it's just because, like, no, you are my son, and I don't care what you've done. I still love you, and I would die for you. And it seems crazy and illogical, but we need to throw away logic, I guess. Not throw it away, but... But I was talking to my friend last night and telling her about this class, and she was saying that as we get older, we learn to hold on to things lighter. Like just to like the thing like you're saying the things are preconceived ideas and stuff so like holding lighter to logic or holding lighter to um, I don't know when you get past 60 you even have to hold your life lighter your future you know it's just if you hang on to it with everything you've got you're going to have your heart broken you know, <laughs> at some point yeah um So, uh, you know, we see in all of this, this justification of God's character, it can come across crass, it certainly can. But in the context of a deception, in the context of confusion and so on, God taking any means possible to help us to see what he is truly like and that he's worthy of our trust. And uh, that, that is the means through which he brings us back to him. So... Let's go to verse 31. Romans 3 and verse 31. And this is a text that I think is pretty well known to people who discuss issues of law and gospel. He says, Do we then nullify the law by this faith? Is faith doing away with the law? Not at all, he says. Rather, we uphold the law. What does he mean by law? The scriptures. Okay. He's saying the full revelation of God is validated by the cross and it's validated by faith. Because when I have faith in this mighty act of God, I am validating what God has done. So the law is used here in the widest possible 
sense, like in verse 21. It is in harmony with the law and the prophets. So, for Paul, the law is abolished as a way of salvation. So when we get into these issues, you know, people say, well, he abolished the law, so why are you talking about the law? Yes, he abolished law without the article as a way of salvation. The principle of obey and live, disobey and die, is, uh, let, let me put it this way. Uh, I'll illustrate it on the board. Let me do this in blue here so it uh, stands out a little different. You have the, you know, in Deuteronomy is the idea, obey and live. Or you could say it, disobey and die. And what happened in Christ? The one who obeyed died so that those who disobey might live. It's a great reversal. You know, and you think of the statement in Desire of Ages that uh, uh, you know, he was treated as we deserve, that we might be treated as he deserves, and uh, that we might have the life that was his. So that, the principle, obey and live, disobey and die, is nullified. It's abolished. Christ smashes it, breaks it into pieces. But law is established as a revealer of how to be saved. We establish the law when we show that this salvation is in harmony with the Old Testament. And uh, when we get to the biblical theology portion, we will see, starting from the book of Genesis, working all the way through, how the gospel was there from the beginning. The gospel is not something that's tacked on to a legalistic Old Testament. And, and there are some honest people who still would, would say that. But it's not tacked on to a legalistic Old Testament. It is the way the Old Testament saves people as well. And uh, Paul asserts that here. He's taking it for granted here. But we will demonstrate it later in the class. Demonstrate how the Old Testament is as much gospel, as much righteousness by faith uh, as the new. It's just in a different form and at a different time. So righteousness by faith doesn't negate the revelation in the Old Testament. Rather, it demonstrates that the gospel is in the Old Testament. Now, that's exactly where Paul goes now. He's saying, now let me show you that the gospel is in the Old Testament. I'm not a renegade from the Old Testament. I'm not a renegade from Judaism when I preach righteousness by faith. When you accept the gospel, you're accepting the Old Testament too. So chapter 4, Paul turns to that issue. Where is the gospel in the Old Testament? Chapter 4, verse 1. What then shall we say? that Abraham, our forefather, discovered in this matter. If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. What's that word credited, Carol? It's a banking word, isn't it? Yeah. Credited, like accounting. Yeah, as you mentioned earlier, the accounting metaphor. Here, here we see one. It was reckoned. Uh, the, the Greek word is logizomai, which uh, has the idea of calculating, reckoning, accounting. So it's a, it's a counting metaphor. So here he says that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. So he's mixing metaphors now. He's got an accounting metaphor and a legal metaphor, all in the same sentence. 
Now when a man works, his wages are not credited to him as a gift, but as an obligation. Now suddenly he's shifting into the workplace metaphor. However, to the man who does not work, but trusts God, who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited as righteousness. Justifies the wicked. So that's the, that's the uh, challenging one. God justifies those who have not been justifiable, in a sense. Then he goes on. Now, now take a look at this. David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will never count against him. So, he's got two examples here. Abraham is a person in the Torah, in the law. And David, he's a person in the prophets. So you have the law and the prophets, which for the Jew is the summary of Scripture, the summary of the Bible. So he takes one major character from each. And you could argue these are the two most important characters in the Old Testament. Could have choose Moses, maybe, instead of Abraham. Uh, they're, they're both very, very big within Judaism. But David kind of jumps out as maybe the most significant figure. It's probably the only story in the Bible that's told virtually complete. Uh, I know someone is writing six novels uh, historical novels about the story of David grounded in the biblical text. I mean, you can only do that when you've got a lot of material, and there's a lot of material there. So uh, he takes an example from the law, an example from the prophets, and Abraham is an example of somebody who does good. He did some bad things, lied about his wife a couple times, uh, there's a few little things like that, but these are, these are not the giant sins, you know, of a David or, uh, or some of the other biblical characters. So Abraham, you would look at and say, well, that's a, he's a pretty good guy. David, on the other hand, is an example of uh, many bad things that occurred in his life. And notice how in the text, Paul's language is expressed differently. What shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, discovered in this matter? If he was justified by works, he had something to boast about, not before God. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as what? Righteousness. Righteousness. So Abraham, though he was good, needed God's righteousness. All continually fall short of the glory of God. So he needed God's righteousness. But notice about David. What does David need? David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the man to whom God creates, credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered, that the Lord will not count the sins against him. So David needed forgiveness. So David and Abraham represent the two sides of sin and the two sides of justification. In a way, uh, no, I won't. I won't take you there. So, the two sides of sin all have sinned. We can put that over here. So, here is the have sinned, all have sinned, and all.
fall short. This is really amazingly put together. You, we think of Paul's letters as kind of being tossed off, you know, almost half, half asleep, you know, sentences that are ten lines long and all kinds of stuff like that. This part of Romans, at least, very carefully crafted. You know, he sets the case for those two chapters. Then he summarizes the gospel, and now he expands on it. The problem of sin, twofold. Good deeds that aren't good enough, bad deeds that completely uh, take us out of line. And uh, on the other hand, justification also has the same two sides. It is covering for the sin, forgiveness for the sin, but it is also a, uh, how should we put it, it is also a uh, filling up of the good deeds that aren't good enough. And he's looking back here on what point in the Old Testament? It says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. So what, where's, where's he pointing back? Okay. Isaac, that's an important part of the thing. But that's actually about 40 years later. This is a quotation of Genesis 15 and verse 6. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. So that's right after Sodom, you know, the Lot story, the Sodom story. It's about seven chapters before Isaac. So Abraham believes God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. By the way, the Jews at that time had a way of using Scripture. They called it the key word method. If a key word is found in two different texts, they can link those texts. What is the key word in Romans 4, 1 to 8 from the Old Testament? Among the Old Testament texts, what's the key word? You, you might not entirely capture it here, but it's the word accredited, counted, that, that, uh, that accounting word. Abraham believed God, it was credited to him as righteousness. But then, verse 8, Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will never count against him. Now, in English, you kind of miss that, okay? But it's the same word, that reckoning, that accounting. God will not count his sin. Psalm 32 is what he's quoting here about David. In Psalm 32, he's counted righteous through forgiveness of his sins. In Genesis 15, he's counted righteous because he believed God. So you see Paul using a typical rabbinical uh, argument here. He's a Genesis 15 and Psalm 32 are linked together by this key word. And since they're linked together in that way, he can use them together here. Uh, and let me just write that down so this, this continues the analogy. Abraham, he's dealing with Genesis 15. And then David, he's dealing with Psalm 32. And of course, David wrote Psalm 32, and uh, uh, Genesis 15 is the story of Abraham's experience at that time. So justification can involve forgiveness on the one hand and reckoning righteous on the other. Any questions? Of these two, it's the Abraham side that's sometimes overlooked in Adventism. Adventists are very strong on the need for forgiveness. We recognize we have sinned. And that that puts us into a place where we cannot save ourselves. We recognize that. But unless you also grasp that 
no matter what you do, you're falling short and you need him. Unless you grasp this, there's still a little bit of a window for pride, a little bit of a window for effort. And there's something about our pride. You know, we like to have a part in our salvation. We like to think we accomplished something. We hate to have something that's simply given to us. You know, we'd like to accomplish something. There was a political speech not that long ago that spoke of the seeming poverty of a political candidate who inherited $250 million from his father. You have no idea who I'm talking about. <laughs> but uh, it was fascinating that, that he perceived his childhood as actually being uh, fairly poor, relatively speaking. And uh, I, think, I think none of us wants to feel like we didn't achieve it, that it was just given to us. You know, so we said, we worked hard for this, you know, see. And uh, don't, don't take any political umbrage at that. I'm just, I'm just, it was just an illustration in my mind how hard it is for us to just say, it was given to me. It's a gift. Um, I had nothing to do with it. Uh, pride is something that uh, chases us down at every level. Romans 4.25. I just want to leave you with one more text, and then we're going to close on Romans. And our next text is James, and the reason we're going to go there uh, we'll come to in a minute. Romans 4, 25. Paul is still following through on this Abraham-David thing, and he speaks now of the cross. Here's where he comes to the cross of Christ, which is lurking behind the scenes throughout this. But now he brings it out up front. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. He was delivered to death for our sins. That's the cross. And raised to life for our justification. That's the resurrection. In 1 Corinthians 15, the gospel is the death and resurrection of Jesus. He died according to the scriptures. He rose according to the scriptures. And that's the gospel. Because in the death of Christ, our sins are taken care of. In the resurrection of Christ, we are justified. We are acceptable to God. The human race rises up with him. He's the representative man. He represents the whole human race. So when he dies on the cross, all of us die with him. When he rises from the grave, all of us rise with him. So there's two things the gospel teaches about us. Number one, we're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Nothing we can do to save ourselves. And to admit that truth is halfway home. I think there are some people that want the good side of the gospel but don't have to confront the depravity. The resurrection of Christ, we're acceptable to God in Jesus Christ. Two sides to the gospel, who we truly are as sinners and who we are in Christ. Any questions, comments, analogies? <laughs> All right, we will then uh, close uh, this segment and uh, we can take another break. I have about 3.49, so we can start again at 4. But before we break, let me just come back to this. Let's go to verse 2. I'm sorry. I, I don't want to just stop. I just want to show you one thing. It says here, verse 2, If Abraham was justified by works... He had something to boast about, but not before God. So he's saying, Abraham was not justified by works. Nothing to boast about. He didn't accomplish anything. All right. Hold your finger there and go to James 2.24. I want to read you one of the biggest seeming contradictions in the Bible, and that'll be the subject of our next segment. James 2, 24. 
you see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. See that? Paul says, Abraham was not justified by works. James says, oh yes, he was. And both of them quote Genesis 15. So what are we going to do with that? That's the subject of the next uh, segment when we get to James chapter 2.